Hi everybody. We're back here at the manufacturer in Schaffhausen from Moser. I'm with Mark Show. Welcome. For a second I was like, wait, wait am I Edouard? Are you Edouard? <laughs> no, you're Edouard. Thank you, Edouard. Thank you for, for your hospitality at the manufacturer. It's been really great so far. Um, so we just shot a couple of videos talking about you know, the Total Eclipse, which is the Army and Moser's collaboration. And uh, I thought since we're here, it would be really great to dig into your catalog and see what other amazing things you've done. Um, sure. You have mentioned basically everything sold out, but you know, just for academic purposes, yeah. right? We should of course look into the catalog and look at history. Yeah, well, everything is sold out now, but I mean, we continue to produce, and there's a lot of things coming and new surprises. So yeah, no, we're happy to uh, to share a little bit mm -hmm. of what we have here. Uh, we don't have much in the in the manufacture at the moment, but yeah, a lot of amazing products that tell the story of Moser over mm -hmm. the years. Um, so there's a lot of things we can talk about. I mean, there's things, remember you mentioned Moser is sometimes seen as a little bit of the maverick mm -hmm. of the watch industry. It's true that there was this time when we took over Moser that we felt the need to emancipate a little bit as a brand and tell people, you know, these are our values. Mm -hmm. This is the way we think. Mm -hmm. And we used a little bit of humor and provocation to, yeah. um, to do such a thing. And it started in 2016 with the Swiss Alp Watch, um, which was a statement for us about what we believe um, the future. This is the one, right? Yeah. Okay, good. I didn't want to get that wrong. Connected watches was, everybody was asking, oh, do you think it's the end of the Swiss watch industries? Are you going to make a connected watch at Moser? We're all about tradition. We're all about, you know, historical watches. Uh, pocket movements, etc. So I was like, oh, you know, how do we express to people really what we believe in and what we want to do? And we thought the best way would be to get inspired from the connected watches, yet to stay true to our tradition, which is mechanical watches. And that's how we created the Swiss Alp watch, mm. which was sub supposed to be kind of a, a, a very small series of about 50 watches. But it got such a success, such so much visibility that we ended up doing, um, I think, 400 of them uh, over four or five years. Mm. Uh, these were movements that we had on inventory and we closed the collection this year, which what we call the the, the final upgrade, which is this one, uh, <laughs> which is a whole black with a kind of a charging element. The small second is representing this one's super the charging clever. symbol and we did 50 of that. And now we're out of, of, um, of movements. So this watch is basically Oh, yeah, really? there are 40, 400, uh, uh, maybe 350 out there in the market. Oh, no. I and didn't realize. It. And people say, oh, you should do another edition. You should reproduce the movement, etc." No, I think it's, it, it, was, it was amazing for the brand. It put us on the map of a lot of people. Mm. And people at that time didn't know Moser but believed in it, liked the concept, the idea, the symbol, the message that this watch was, mm. was uh, promoting. I think the best way to, uh, to thank them and, and to Pro continue to protect our brand is to say, no, oh, it's finished. That was four years, amazing years, and yeah. now we have other things. Yeah, I think that's great. And, you know, I think this watch really brought, like, put Moser in a lot of people's minds. Like, uh, I think this is people. the f earliest one that I can yeah. really remember. It's like, oh, wow, that's a Moser. A lot of people remind M Moser from that. On the others, uh, I mean, for many years, people would say, oh, where do you work, Moser? Oh, the cheese watch. Because a year later, after the success of that one, we, you know, my father told me, oh, you should have those kind of things every year. And I'm like, oh, yeah, well, well you need to find <laughs> ideas. But thanks, thanks God, at that time, we had another idea, which was about Swiss made. Mm -hmm. Swiss made regulations were changing 2017, mm -hmm. early 2017, and we created a watch to symbolize our perspective on that. At that time, you know, Swiss made means, at that time before, was me uh, meant uh, for watches that were at least at 50% of the um, added value made of Switzerland. That means you could do a lot of things outside Switzerland and mm. still be Swiss made. Mm. Moser, it's 100% Swiss, mm -hmm. made pretty much in-house and a few things that we, we buy, um, like the straps, etc. Mm. So we said, you know, we don't want, we don't need that label. So we removed the Swiss made label from all our watches since 2017 and we created a cheese watch because we wanted the most Swiss watch ever made. We don't have gold in Switzerland, so I thought, you know, what's the most precious material we have? <laughs> and that's cheese. So we made a case of cheese. Unfortunately, I don't have this watch because we auctioned it, and it's now held by a, a collector, in, I think, in Singapore. Um, and we auctioned it for a foundation to support young watchmakers. Mm. And I think Christie sold it for 130,000 euros or something like this. Wow. But I have uh, uh, one of the prototypes of the limited edition we did at the same time of 50 pieces, and you can see like representation of the Swiss flag. There's a Swiss cow skin on the on the strap. Uh, but the origin, the unique piece was the case was made of real cheese from my village. I grew up in the mountains. No way. Okay. Mixed with a polymer so that it it doesn't stink. It doesn't you, know, you don't see the watch moving uh, after and a few months. Yeah, you probably shouldn't eat that. Yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> but that was a great success. But 
Yeah, it was it was funny because for many years people were telling me, oh, Moser, that's the cheese watch. I was like, yeah, well, there's much more than that at Moser. <laughs> you know, we do a lot of things and uh, we have beautiful movements. We have a long history and that's an example of, um, of, of the way for us to express our history. That's our heritage collection. And mm -hmm. we did a few months ago a bronze version with an historical logo of Moser. Moser was pretty strong in Russia, Ukraine, and many of the, along the Silk Road. And uh, in certain uh, countries, they were using a Cyrillic logo. So we decided to express the, f the fact that Moser had a long history also in Russia and those places. In some occasions, every four years, we do a capsule of 50 pieces uh, using that historical logo. So that's why here you have a, a Cyrillic logo in this bronze um, watch. We called it the Since 1828 because the, the brand is uh, 194 years old and, uh, and it's inspired by the watches that we've seen today in the museum. Mm. We have a lot of historical watches similar to this one. The new models here, very modern. We use a technique called Globalite. So we mold in ceramic with superluminova every single numeral. Mm. And then in, at, in the night, it glows amazingly well and it's really three dimensional. Again, it's more very traditional, mm -hmm. but very modern at the same time. I love this piece. It's really like, this is the first time I've seen the metal because this was, basically the last release of 2021, right? Yeah. Like it was it just barely got in Dubai Watch Week. Yeah, it was uh, end of November. And now you guys have the first release of 2022 as well. Uh, yeah, wearing it. There you go, there you go. Yeah, we like, we like um, you know, to explore new things, to do, to do things like this, like drops or collaborations. And yeah. I mean, but you don't about rely on it, you know? No, you, but it's, you reference it, but you don't rely on it. It, it keeps the brand dynamic, it pushes us, makes us explore things, mm. do sometimes crazy, th crazy things. A few years ago, we, we liked to play on the 1st of April with kind of things that people wonder whether it's a joke or not. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember, the first one tablack we did with black hands. And we did a, a picture where we put actu actually like a watch that was just a black, Dot, right? Okay. Black. And everybody was like, I mean, we thought it would be a joke for the 1st of April, April full joke. And we got so many orders that a year later, we actually made the watch. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, then we said we need to continue to do things that w where people will wonder whether it really, did they do it or not? So a year ago, we did uh, something, a collaboration with a French artist called Second Second. I love this one. This one's Second Second is a, is a French guy and go on, on Instagram and you can follow him. He's crazy, creating amazing things with a lot of vintage watches, uh, but with a meaning, very mm -hmm. intellectual. Sometimes, I mean, he lives in a different world, uh, but I, I know him for quite some time and, and I know he works with vintage, but I asked him, what would you do with a Moser? Could you make something? Mm -hmm. And he came up with the idea of, the philosophy of Moser is going into minimalism, uh, trying to find the essence of a product, which is part of, a, of what we want to mm -hmm. be. And he yeah. said, uh, the way I, I would symbolize that is like an architect or an artist, you know, you, when you do something and you search perfection, you tend to try and try again and mm -hmm. erase and et cetera. So that's oh, why yeah. he, he symbolized that with the uh, our hand being a, an eraser, a traditional eraser that we had, you know, as kids at school. And we did 20 of them. A lot of people thought it was a joke. A lot of people, didn't like it, but thanks God, a lot of people loved it. And yeah, yeah we, we did great. 20 of them and they were, they were sold very quickly. But you know, yes, it's something different. It's there's, something- There's nothing as sophisticated- Philosophical. Exactly, right? And there's nothing as, as sophisticated as just having a sense of humor about yeah. things, you know? This was a really, this was a lovely, lovely piece. I'm really happy you guys made this. Yeah, and it's, I think it's, again, it helps a few people better understand what Moses stands for, mm. also in terms of, uh, the campaign we had at that time in the movie was about Moser. We consider watches as art pieces mm. and not commodities. We don't feel like we need to brand them as actually a lot of our watches don't even have a logo on it. Mm. We think that if the design of the watch doesn't talk for itself for being a Moser, then mm. that means we have done not such a good job in creating that particular model. So yeah, that helps force us into staying true to our clear design and functional guidelines. Mm. You know, it's funny you say that. I, I literally, I, I wrote something very similar recently for a Watchbox interview um, where the question was, you know, are watches art? And for me, you know, I, I do think, I think there are many watches that aren't necessarily art, but I do think there are a lot of watches that are art. And I think it's when you see something and you feel like it has a very distinct handwriting, right? That means that thing has character. And yeah. if something has character, it's a very personal expression. So it is art, yeah. you know? And I think that's like the threshold that you need to cross before it really becomes an art piece but I think a lot of Mosers, not all Mosers actually, do make that threshold. Yeah, to a different extent. And I think a good example is the picture we have here behind. And we're yes. lucky to have one of them here. It's this collaboration with this another collaboration. 
uh, that we did with MBNF. MBNF is uh, another independent brand uh, run by uh, by Max Busso. Mm -hmm. Many many mm -hmm. people know in the in the watch industry mm -hmm. for being one of the first uh, in, in the independent world and, and pushing mm -hmm. also this industry. And uh, we were very. Uh, Proud and happy to collaborate together mm. with uh, with him in creating two collections: one for MBNF, one for Moser. That's the Moser collection. Mm. It's called a, it's a cylindrical tourbillon with uh, an element from uh, elements from both brands. And that was the idea. Both brand, those watches, his collection and our collection should look a little bit like both. Yeah. And the result is is amazing, and it was an amazing success, both in terms of um, of uh, of media visibility, coverage, positive message in the industry. It was the middle of the pandemic when mm. we launched it, where everybody was like, oh, it's the worst time to launch something. But at the same time, I think it, it brought a little bit of a smile to a lot of people because mm. this is art. I think for yeah. me, this is yeah. as far as Moser has gone in terms of creating an art, uh, a pure art piece. Man, I love it's this. not the most practical. There's a beautiful big dome on it. It's but it's so much about what we love in this industry is creating something. I mean, people don't need mechanical watches, right? So it's really about something when you look at it, you should have like a big smile and you feel like a connection to the product. You understand here, you see a lot of the mechanics. We develop a cylindrical to be on. So it's very three dimensional so that people can really appreciate it. Yeah, I was Same say. thing with the sub dial from, from Max with this 45 uh, degrees and we made it transparent so you can really see the intrinsic mechanics behind it. Because you developed the hair, like you are one of the few people able to develop hair springs in house too. Yes, for ourselves and about twenty five clients, and we do. We known for like the special things. The big brands come to us when they need something very small, very big, three dimensional, something different. If you want the standard, um, there's a few suppliers, but they, these are the big groups. Um, we do the spe special, high quality things. So I was in your kind of hairspring lab just now, and you have one of these cylindrical hairsprings, kind of just on its own, cased up. Um, I, will, I will throw that up um, on this video because it's such a beautiful thing to look at too. Yeah. Really incredible. Have, have you done this before? Is this a new concept for hair springs? It's actually, to be honest, it, it's, it was lost in, in, in history. I mean, the, the first um, marine chronometers were using cylindrical uh, really? hair springs. The problem is space. Watches right. has to be thin, has to be True. so many brands don't use them. But what's interesting is the, the you fix it at the center on both sides, so it's a very it's it's it unfolds very symmetrically. So mm -hmm. it's 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 a it's very good performance for isochronismus. The problem with with modern watches, you don't have space for them, and uh, that's why we created in the meantime Brege curves and other mm -hmm. systems to uh, to uh, compensate the fact that uh, it's not concentric. But uh, in that particular watch, it has the space. So it was good to bring it back to life. We have, uh, Max has used it also in uh, one of his uh, watches in the, in the past. And we will continue to do this. We also developed uh, spherical hairsprings uh, and many other, other, wow, wow, other really? uh, shapes. Yeah. Incredible. I'll return that to you before I run off with it. <laughs> Thank you. And then the last but not least is the last collection we launched were two years ago now, uh, exactly two years ago, mm. which um, took us a long time. We always wanted to create an integrated steel bracelet uh, watch, but uh, again, we don't want to be like the others, so we had to create something mm. that would be Moser, yet very different from, mm. from the others. So that's a long process, mm. um, and you need to take risks as well. Mm. And to be honest, the the, the, the most common comment I have received in the last two years uh, was, it's growing on me. A lot of the historical Moser owners were not sure about this new design mm -hmm. when we launched the Streamliner because it's different. Yeah. Yet for me, it's really Moser. But even for me, the first time I had this watch in my hands after years and years of development, I was like, is this what I was expecting? You know, you, you, know, you, you have a process. You know, it's like your baby, it comes out and you're like, what, can I talk to it? <laughs> <laughs> happened to me. Um, so but yeah, it's how been long was this in because it was a long time. I remember you mentioned. Well, it's tough to years. say. I like uh, some, when when I talked to the team said, yeah, we started seven years ago. Yes, we started seven years ago, but but we probably stopped five times on, along the way. So probably it's been three, four years where really like on the moment we suddenly said, okay, that's the design of the bracelet we want. Mm. We started with the bracelet. For me. An integrated, st integrated steel bracelet watch is mm. all about the bracelet. Of course. Yep. So you cannot build a watch and then put a bracelet on it. You, Absolutely. you, you create the bracelet, mm -hmm. the design, the, f the, 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 you know, the craftsmanship and all those elements, and then you build the watch. Mm -hmm. So we, we probably found the, the, the philosophy of the type of bracelets we wanted about four years, ago, four years prior to launching. And then, um, and then it was about four years to go through all the, the elements and cho choosing the right movements, the dial, and 
yeah, all those elements. And then the, f the final result is here we have, for example, with, with uh, three examples, we have the first one that we launched is the um, flyback chronograph automatic. Uh, that was the first one we launched on the 9th of January 2020. Um, first in gray, now available in blue. So I was going to ask you, why the chronograph as the first one? Because I believe this, the the steel, integrated steel bracelet watch is kind of a sport chic watch. Yeah. So I wanted a sport chic movement. And I think the chronograph is the ultimate sport movement. So we created a chronograph that actually gives time. Mm. It's not a watch with a chronograph function. Mm. Everything on the dial is all about the, the chronograph function. Mm. Just in addition, we put two hands to give you the time. So yeah. that's a, a bit of the philosophy of Moser, is go to the essence of a function. Yeah. And the flyback chronograph uh, movement is, is just amazing. So we work with Agenor on that one. We have an amazing 400, more, over 400 parts movement in there. It's automatic, but you don't see it because we have put the, the rotor behind the dial just so that people can appreciate the beauty of this particular movement. This movement is really, really, really fabulous. You've seen the small Batman in the center now? Small Batman figure. That's typical. The watchmakers they like to make jokes, dad jokes. <laughs> dad jokes. Watchmaker dad jokes. Okay, that's you definitely going to the comment section. Was the, you know the what? Center. My eyesight is so. Bad. Oh, I see it. I see. It, I see it. Okay, I see it. Yeah. Oh it's, wow. Uh, yeah. They're like you know, in computer science, um, uh, code codes. So people hide codes in their in the. Yeah. Or you got to uh, put hello the, world the, somewhere in the, there. The watchmakers they do the same. That's funny. And you know, just to dig a little bit deeper on the agnograph, because I think it's such an incredible movement. What's special about the agnograph is that you use one hand basically to do all of the chronograph functions that you used to split onto subdials, right? Yeah. So we do everything through the center, and in this case, it's a sixty-minute. Uh, chronograph. So you have a uh, you have one hand for the seconds and one hand for the minutes, mm. um, and yeah, that's that's the philosophy. But I want it, it should be very intuitive, and I think having sub dies and having to look at different positions is mm. not. I mean, it's not the mo the simplest way. Yeah. I think it should be through the center, like the old, uh, you know, typical like Omega, whatever chrono hand chronographs that we had for yeah. the Olympics and stuff like that. Yeah. And I like the idea of the bull head. Um, we were talking about chronoscope, uh, chronostop, and, and 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 watches like this. I think yeah. these are amazing designs from the 60s and 70s, and yet it couldn't have been made in the 70s. There's a little bit of the 70s in this watch, of course. Mm. Inspiration um, or from there. Uh, some people mentioned Porsche design and, and Abel, and, but I think none of that could have been done at that time because yeah. it's very organic, three-dimensional. Yeah. And, uh, and to be honest, uh, we had discovered most of the link to the past after we had created. Uh, the source of inspiration for this bracelet was a, a small part, and I mentioned it to you the other day, um, um, the part of a bracelet that somebody showed me from an Ikepod mm. uh, watch. And um, I, I just loved it. I love the way it's, it's, it, it fits any wrist. It's very flexible, yet very strong, and um, yeah, almost reptile. Yeah, there's what something... What people call this one, the Green Dragon. There's something very kind of state-of-the-art, not just to the movement, but also to the bracelet design. Like, it's something that you couldn't do 50 years ago, no. 30 years ago, you know. And then the Green Dragon was next, right? Yes, then we launched the, the Green Dragon. So we had the chronograph, then we wanted something a little bit simpler. Uh, this is 40, uh, 42, uh, 42 right? millimeter. Yeah. Here we have a 40 millimeter. Uh, simple center second with a, with a gold rotor. And this is our uh, classic center second movement with global light hands, matrix green, fumidile. Um, yeah, 120 meter water resistance, so very practical. Watch here, you have a prototype of a, of a micro adjustment buckle that is not yet available, but we're working on it. I know a lot of people have been asking. This is, a, I mean, this entire collection has taken off like, yeah. like crazy. I mean, yeah. right now we, are, we, we stopped taking orders because we just couldn't, I mean, I felt bad telling people, peop, our retailers taking orders, deposits, and not being able to tell them when they would get the watches. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, sold out, we, um, we slowed down, but these are not limited. So eventually they'll be produced. It just uh, takes time also to train watchmakers to, uh, to grow a little bit our capacity. And we didn't want to, you know. Yeah, good things can't be rushed. Right? Abuse the system. Yeah. Absolutely. So yes, this is the Green Dragon, and this is the late, latest release, which is the, the Perpetual Calendar. Perpetual Calendar from Moser is, I would say, one of the most iconic movements that yeah. we ever de developed. Um, here we have a new 
design on the movement, new codes that we will see also more and more in the um, Streamliner collection and the Pioneer collection, the mm -hmm. more sporty look. Mm -hmm. That's really important to me to have clear codes for our movements the way we finish them. Mm. And this is a little bit darker with horizontal lines, whereas um, on the classics we have uh, lighter gray, 45 degrees lines. Um, and yeah, it's the perpetual calendar, center second, everything at the center, like the chronograph. Again, we're trying to keep certain homogeneity, mm. uh, not only in terms of design, but also in terms of function, the way we design the function. And yeah, an amazing you know, watch, same size as the chronograph, 42 millimeter. You mentioned that when you first took over Moser, the perpetual calendar was like the movement yeah. that you really fell in love with. Yeah, Mo Moser won the Grand Prix Genève for the first time in 2006 with the perpetual calendar, even though it didn't work. I mean, they had a few prototypes. Still didn't work in 2012 when we took over. I mean, it was a nightmare. I mean, I love that movement. and to some extent uh, was one of the reasons why we bought Moser, mm. took over Moser. But I didn't realize at that time how complicated it was to make it work. Mm. And then we, we spent quite a couple of years to re-engineer, make it better to a point where now it's extremely reliable. But yeah, it's, it's a complex movement. A movement like this one takes years, five, six years to, uh, to mm. bring from idea to something that can go in production. Yeah. The problem is they probably went to the market before they went through this production phase mm. or, or re-engineering phases. Mm. So we did that afterwards. Because, you know, for the user, it's it's really an idiot-proof movement. Like Rafi, oh, yeah. your, your head of watchmaking, was kind child, of running child through proof, it. Child-proof, yes. It, yeah, child-proof. It's mark-proof for sure. Because <laughs> you can run it forwards and backwards too. Any time of the day, forward, backwards. It's, it's, I mean, you, you, usually perpetual calendar, people are scared because they, if they put it in the safe, how do I put it back to the, yeah. to the right date? Here in 30 seconds, yeah. Anybody can put it back to the yeah. right uh, date. Um, you can go forward, backwards. You cannot break the system. Yeah. Uh, traditional perpetual calendars, you do a ma mis manipulation, then your watch is gone for four months, and it costs you a, an arm and a leg yeah. before you get it back. Yeah, which is a scary thing. I think a lot of people have always been kind of reluctant to get into perpetual calendars. It's, an, it's one of the most practical uh, complications to perpetual calendar. On yeah. the watch, you need the time, and you need to, do, to know the date of today. Yeah without having to care, oh, is, do I have to adjust at the end of the month or not? So that's why perpetual cal calendar yeah. is, I think, the best function. The problem for a lot of people, they, they're too scared of breaking it. So that's why it hasn't been the most popular. Mm. But I think it's the best. Interesting. Um, OK, let's wrap this up with, I didn't, I didn't brief you on this. If you can make anything, what would you want to make? Complication-wise, like case-wise, material-wise, just some sort of dream watch that doesn't exist yet. Uh, material is easy. I mean, we're exploring a lot of materials, but deep inside my heart, tantalum, mm -hmm. uh, and I mentioned that a few times, and we're working on it, uh, is my dream. I, um, that's the first watch I got from my father was a steel tent tantalum watch, and I don't know why, it just stuck. And I, my dream is, I find it to be a beautiful material. I like the shade, and I know it's complex, I know it's difficult to polish, etc. but I like the weight of it, mm -hmm. I like the, the warmth of, mm -hmm. the, of the color, so yeah, tantalum, definitely. Uh, what I would like, I think Moser, we have a lot of complications. We have the miniature repeater, we have tourbillon, uh, we have pe uh, perpetual calendar, perpetual moon, center second, cylindrical tourbillon, big date, dual time. I would like to combine more, more of those into grand complication, which we don't have mm. yet. I think, I think the next level for us is to try a grand complication is, I think, at least three complications combined together. I see. So that's, that's kind of my dream, uh, having, you know, take the... I mean, let's be crazy. You take the, chrono the, the agenograph, put the perpetual calendar of Moser and a beautiful miniature repeater, something like this, that would be, that would be out amazing. of this world wow. in a tantalum case, <laughs> streamliner, 120 meter water resistant for every day. Wow, that'd yeah. be amazing, actually. That would be cool. That's quite a dream. That's Automatic. Quite a dream. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you my dream watch just because, you know, I want to seed it in your mind so you might think about it one day. That's the next, <laughs> next collaboration. I love the minute repeater you do. I think the minute repeater you guys do is amazing. And I would love for you to make a 36 millimeter version of that. Just a tiny, tiny little minute repeater. Yeah. That would be so elegant. I think it would be amazing. I agree. I mean, right now, we, we until now, we're at 43. Now we're going to be at 40. This year, we will be secret releasing the, oh, okay. the 40 millimeter uh, minute repeater for Moza. Uh, but going down to 36 means uh, a lot of developments, yeah. but I agree, I think thin, small is nice. Uh, I think that's, yeah. I mean, the Total Eclipse is a good example of that, but that's a simpler movement. When it True. goes to a miniature repeater, you need also to consider water resistance, um, and those kind of elements uh, with the trigger, so that takes a lot of space. So you need a very, very tiny movement. 
typically what uh, you know brands like uh, Gerald Genta uh, were doing back then in the in the 80s. Yeah. And, um, today we, we we I think the industry went more towards larger, not too th thick, but quite large. Mm. But we might go back to those kind of movements. But it, you, that would mean probably a 25 millimeter movement, mm. which is for a miniature Peter, it's really tiny. Yeah, that would but be tough. Not? Well, fingers crossed. Ten years from now. Yeah. Or, you know, when we invent a shrink ray. Yeah. And we can just shrink ray whatever is already there. Yeah, I wished it would work. But <laughs> we tried that, you know, even with the case. I mean, you know that better than me, but we had a few cases where we're like, oh, I like this one. Let's do the same in 39. And you take everything, you make a homotacy, yeah. reduce, and it doesn't work. Yeah. No, you need to uh, readjust all the dimensions. You know, that's a really interesting point, too. Like, and it's something I've been thinking about a little bit recently. Like, are certain watches just meant to be a certain size? You know, like something like the Speedmaster, right? The Omega Speedmaster is a 42 millimeter watch. And much as I'd love to have a 38 millimeter Speedmaster, it just wouldn't be a Speedmaster anymore. You know, and, and there's something about when you start to, even if you're gonna proportionally enlarge or shrink things, something about the character of it changes. And I haven't really figured out like exactly why it is. I think it depends. I, I think the, the thing with the Speedmaster is it's an icon. So we got mm -hmm. used to it as it is. And changing yeah. it, you'd be like, no, that's not the same. Yeah. Whereas I think things that are in evolution, I mean, there's, there's things that you can play with and, and try bigger, smaller, and then eventually will settle into a iconic um, mm. dimensions, probably. Mm. All right. Well, listen, Edouard, thank you so much for this great conversation. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your insights on these. It has been absolutely wonderful. And... Um, I guess I hope to see you again soon, and I hope to do some more content with you sometime soon. Definitely. Thanks, man. Thanks for watching, guys.